we're starting a brand new way of teaching at the feast. We're starting something exciting. God is birthing a whole new generation of people who will hunger to follow the word. By book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, story by story. We're gonna sit at the master's feet with total humility and allow the text as divinely inspired to speak to our hearts. Get ready because we're gonna start this journey of longing and really understanding God and His Word for you. It's another beautiful day. Welcome to Feast at Home, everybody. This is your builder, Brother Audie Villaraza, and together with Brother Bo Sanchez, we want to thank you for dropping by and choosing to hang out with us. We're grateful that you allow us to enter into your personal private space every single Sunday. I hope and pray that the message that we prepared today for you will change you, will inspire you, and will bless you, that God will use this to speak to you. Let's begin as we come in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Everybody, open your hands like this and say this with me. Today, I receive all of God's love for me. Today, I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today, I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today, I open myself to God's Word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today, I proclaim that I am God's beloved, I am God's servant, and I am God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I ask you to stretch your hands towards the screen and let's give honor to God's word by singing. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want to welcome all of you to the fourth installment of Miracles and More. This talk today is actually for anybody who is experiencing anxiety and stress in the season of their life. And so if that's you, this talk is for you, all right? The title of our message for today is this, Make Me Calm. You know, so far, we have seen Jesus do some very significant miracles. We are coming to know slowly Jesus as a great healer, right? He had just healed the leper, for example, the centurion servant. And then last Sunday, we talked about this, Peter's mother-in-law, Mama B, and also a host of other sick people in a healing rally in Capernaum. And, you know, just a few chapters before this, and on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was describing the kingdom, but now Jesus was actually doing the kingdom. This is the word that I'm telling you that we're not just hearers of the word, but we are doers, all right? So it's becoming clearer and clearer to people that this man named Jesus was a great healer. I mean, he had the power to heal, but was that all he could do? That was the big question that Matthew was asking, and I believe that this is a question that Jesus asks us today. Who am I to you? Jesus is asking. All right? The scripture that we're going to break down today will reveal another facet of Jesus. And I pray that God will use this to reveal a new angle of who He is in your life and what He can do. Okay, We're going to read two Bible stories today. The first one uh, is where Jesus silences a storm. And the second one, which I'm going to read to you afterwards at the closing, is where Jesus destroys some demons. Okay, So let's read. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 8. We are on verse 23. It says here, Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake 
with his disciples, all right? Matthew was actually referring here to the Sea of Galilee, but a lot of people refer to this place as a lake because why? It's very small. Like for example, Lake Galilee is only 60% of the Lake, okay? That's how small it is. And so in verse 24, it says, Suddenly, a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. You know, the Sea of Galilee is known by people back then to be very bipolar. You know, like some people, you know, who are happy one moment and then after a few seconds, they become like the Incredible Hulk. You know, any people like that? That's how the Sea of Galilee was. It would be stor- it would be calm and then stormy the next moment. The Sea of Galilee was always known for its sudden and fierce storms that people who generally went to that sea, they were uncomfortable. Why? Because they believed that the sea was full of frightening creatures like, you know, the Loch Ness Monster, for example. And then verse 25, it says, The disciples went and woke him up shouting, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. You know, we already know from this text alone that this storm was quite special. Why? Because these guys were hardened and seasoned fishermen who have experienced lots of storms in their life. So for them to be terrified, it meant that this was no ordinary storm. But then Jesus responds like this in verse 26. Why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Leave it to Jesus to give a little sermon in the middle of a storm, right? You know, if anything, this teaches us and reveals to us that Jesus doesn't get scared of storms. Aren't you glad that even a great storm doesn't scare our God? So for that reason, God's not scared of that sickness. He's not scared of that shortage. He's not scared of your shame. He's not scared of your sin because He is sovereign. Can I get an amen from someone? Then He got up. And, and rebuke the wind and the waves. And suddenly there was a great calm. And then verse 27, the disciples were amazed. And then they asked, who is this man? They asked, even the winds and the waves obey him. This is the first story that we're going to read today. All right. The second one is I'm going to read to you at the closing part, but let's pray for now. All right. Everybody close your eyes, bow down your heads. Jesus, we thank you for this word. We thank you that this has leapt out of the page and into our hearts. But we pray, oh God, with your spirit, that we would understand every single word, that it would mean something to us. Break it down to a practical way. And we declare today, oh Jesus, that you will speak and we will hear. You are sovereign over everything in this world, oh God. You are sovereign over every sickness, every calamity, every catastrophe, every challenge, and every difficulty. And so we look to you as our God. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. One more time, everybody. Lift your hands in honor of God's word. And let's sing. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Hallelujah. God bless you. God empower you. God fill you up. God's presence be so strong in your life. What a privilege that you have allowed me now to enter your home and your heart here at the feast. Are you ready? My message is this. God is in your boat. Hallelujah. Have you ever experienced chaos in your life? I have many times. And, but let me share with you one of the earliest ones that I experienced. I was 12 years old. I was graduating from grade school, going into high school. And for the life of me, I do not know what, what went into the brains of my mom and my dad because they wanted me to study in the Ateneo High School. Now, can I say this to you that ever since the beginning, I was a lazy student. I wanted to tell them, Mom, Dad, are you sure? Do, you know, did have, do you have, are you suffering from amnesia now when you forgot my report cards and the grades that I've been getting all these past years? Do you want me to look at them right now and <laughs> pick, pick one and shuffle those cards and just, you know, pick one at random and present to you my grades that I am not worthy? But, you know, the, no, they, they wanted me and so... Friends, let, let, me, let me share this with you. Recently, there was this young woman who wrote to me and told me that she was depressed. Why? <laughs> this is her story. 
that she was always a straight A student. But then this sem semester, she had one subject, one, that was a B plus. And her mother was so angry at her and it broke her heart. You know, this, this young woman writing to me and OMG, I cannot relate. Really, I, I, I absolutely cannot relate. I wanted to write that, that mother. I, I wanted to say, mother, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> this is wild. I, I, I wanted to write to her that, you know, you, your daughter, when she was, when, when I was your daughter's age, and I would get a 75, a 75, my mom will throw a party, invite the, all the homeowners association and, you know, serve lechon. I'm exaggerating, but, you know, she will be very happy. But here you are, you know, your daughter has one B plus for crying out loud. The rest is A and you go ballistic. Anyway, anyway, let me go back to my story. So I took the Ateneo High School entrance exam and my parents believed in me so much that they did not you know, think that I should take other entrance exams in other schools. So a few weeks after the exam, I was in the front lawn of my house and then the mailman comes and I was there. So I got the bunch of envelopes for us. One of them had my name on it. One of them was there with my name and it came from the Ateneo High School Department. And so with trembling fingers, I opened the envelope I unfolded the letter and it said there, Dear Mr. Sanchez, we regret to inform you dot, dot, dot. At that singular moment, I felt I was the dumbest kid in the entire galaxy. You know, true to form. That's how we exaggerate, right? You know, one school rejected me, but I felt that the entire country was rejecting me. And, and I, I was, that, at that moment, it was panic time. It was chaos at home because my parents realized, oh no, time is running out, you know, and it, it, you're going you're, you're gonna to miss a school year. I said, I'm going to miss a school year. Inwardly, I said, yes, <laughs> but no, it was panic time. It was really chaos. They had to go from school to school. They burned the lines, called this up, called that person, trying to find ways. And uh, there, at the very last minute, one school accepted me, Claret High School. And, uh, but that was a wild time, like, like anxiety through the roof, you know, just searching for a school for me. But let me share with you what happened to me a few years later. I was in first year high when I joined the Bible quiz and it was a national, a national TV. And it lasted for two years because I had to keep on competing and competing, uh, going up the levels. And finally, after two years, I was the grand champion. And do you know what my prize was? Can I tell you? A four-year college scholarship at the Ateneo de Manila University. And <laughs> that was wild, right? It's like, OMG. My parents, they wanted me to go to the Ateneo High School and God was saying, no, nah, no, nah, you wait for me, you wait for me. Sometimes what we think is a denial is actually a delay. And God knows your future. Are you going through chaos right now? Are you going through panic? Are you going through anxiety? Listen to me. God knows your future. God knows your story, every detail, every facet, every angle. And He invites you to trust in Him. He invites you to trust in God. Why? Because in the midst of that storm, there is a God beside you in your boat. God is in your boat. Now, I want to read with you again the, that whole story and just, just go a little bit slower. And I, I pray that it will be a revelation for you. Are you ready? Here we go. In uh, verse 23, Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. And then Matthew said something absolutely strange. Absolutely, he said, but Jesus was sleeping. <laughs> you, you know, who would sleep 
in a fragile, flimsy fishing boat being slammed by monster waves and winds. Who would do that? Well, Jesus. Now, why? I'll give you a practical answer. I was thinking, you know, if I was in the, in the sandals of Jesus, uh, yeah, I would probably also be sleeping because, um, you know, I would preach for two sessions at the feast and then, you know, every ebb of energy would be just drained out of me. And, and then after, after each ses session, just praying over hundreds of people. So, you know, by Sunday afternoon, I'm useless. I'm, I'm totally useless. I'm, I will crash on the couch for two hours and I'll, I'll, I'll just be, be dead. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I figured this was what happened to Jesus because he healed a lot of people. He had an evening healing rally in Capernaum. But then... I want to ask a deeper question. So maybe that's the practical answer. But did Matthew have a theological, deeper meaning to this whole idea that Jesus was sleeping on the boat? I do. I have two reflections on that. And I will give them to you at the later part of this talk. Freeze that question. Why was Jesus sleeping on the boat? I'm going to answer another question. The whole idea of water now, why will I ask about water, storm, waves? What, what's that? Ah, my dear friends, the Old Testament. When Matthew wrote the gospel, he assumed, assumed that all his readers, all his readers, they understood the Old Testament. For many Christians, the Old Testament is a story of barbaric, blood battle gore you know not very nice to read i'd rather read the old new testament you know not the old testament but listen let me make an announcement the old testament was the bible of jesus that was what he read and if we will not understand the old testament the way jesus understood the old testament we will not be able to fully understand him jesus and, and, and this is crucial. I, I, I need to emphasize that. And so to understand this story of the storm and Jesus sleeping in the boat, let's go back to the Old Testament and ask this question. What was the symbolism of water? Now, in the Bible, throughout the, the, the Old Testament, the Bible of Jesus, water was the primary image of chaos. Oh, yes. It, you just have to go to the very first page of the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Let's read. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering the surface of the waters. In the time of Noah, what destroyed planet earth? Water through the great flood. And then moving forward, Moses and the Israelites, guess what? What saved them? Passing through the water, the Red Sea. What destroyed the armies of Pharaoh and the, and the Egyptian chariots? The Red Sea, water again. You go to their prayer book, the book of Psalms, and the, the, look, look at this. This, this, is, this, is from, this is from Psalms 169. Um, the psalmist had a horrible experience in his life. And how did he describe it? Let me read it for you. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. So now using the lens of the Old Testament, let's read the story again. Let's continue reading. We're back to the, the storm. The disciples went and woke him up, Jesus, shouting, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Uh-huh. Familiar? Familiar? You know, when Matthew is writing that, he wants you to hyperlink different parts of this story back to the Old Testament. That was his intention. Jesus responded, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up, rebuked the wind and waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man? They asked. Even the winds and waves obey him. Friends, that question, who is this? This man, that was the intention of Matthew, why he was writing this story and why he was retelling the story to you. 
um, he, he was asking that question, who is this man? Is he just a healer? Is he just a teacher? Is he just a prophet? Or is he someone more? But if you use the lens of the Old Testament, get this, I hope you're listening. This is shocking. What Yahweh was doing in the Old Testament, Jesus was now doing. Are you with me on this? This is wild. In other words, Matthew was saying, Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. Blows my mind that that Matthew was saying that and and, and telling that, 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 oh man, he was showing that whatever Yahweh was doing in the Old Testament, Jesus was also doing. And so the, the, the revelation, this revelation is very shocking. Uh, this is an astounding claim. I'm, I remember the quote from C.S. Lewis. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You know, no wonder Jesus was crucified. Because the claim was, he was God. Now, let me take one step backward and go to modern times. It's, let's face it, we're all Catholics. We kind of like, yeah, Jesus is God. Sure. It's easy, right? Can I go deeper and be more personal with you? Is he your God? Especially when you are in the middle of a storm, especially when all hell breaks loose and you are surrounded by chaos, will you trust this God who is sleeping in your boat? Why don't we go back to that strange, strange, absolutely strange verse, but Jesus was sleeping. I have two reflections, two answers. I'll give you the first one now. The second one will be at the later part of this talk, but here's the first one. You can debate with me on this. I won't mind, you know. Uh, I may be wrong. You know, this is just my personal opinion, but I, I, I want to connect the sleeping Jesus on the boat with a God who was resting on the seventh day. That I believe, and this is just my personal opinion, that in the midst of crisis, in the midst, and, and we have a crisis right now, global, country, nationwide, personal, you know, you've got all these things happening around you. I believe God is always inviting us to enter into the eternal Sabbath, to be able to rest in Him and trust in this God who is sleeping at the boat. He's inviting you to rest as well. He is inviting you. Uh, in the book of Psalms, there are two verses there I want to quote with you. The first one is the most popular psalm in the entire world. Psalms 23, verse 2, uh, verse 1 and 2. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then it says here, He leads me to rest. He lets me rest. And then here's another one. In Psalms 127, verse 2. For the Lord provides for those he loves while they are asleep. While they are asleep, God provides. Today, perhaps you feel that God is absent in your life. You've been praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and it seems he's not listening or he's sleeping. But can I give you my word? Can I preach to you? May I preach to you today? He is listening you think he's absent? No, he's very present. In fact, he's beside you. And he is in your boat. Remember my story? When I was rejected by that good school? Somewhere along the way, you know, some part of me, interpretation, I'm really dumb, you know, gosh. You know, it's no, no, no surprise, you know, my, my life is over. <laughs> my life is over. Oh, I'm going to miss a school year. Yay, you know, yeah, nothing, you know. And he, here's the thing. And, and my parents were panicking and all of that. But I, I really think God at that moment was saying, chill, rest, relax, sleep. Everything will be all right. Trust me. Trust in me. And this is the message that God is giving to you right now. Right now, this moment, this very moment. There's a storm in your life. You're going through a crisis. You're going through these difficulties. But there's this God 
who is sleeping beside you. And his word for you is this. Chill. Relax. Rest. Sleep. Everything will be all right. God is in your boat. God bless you. I hope and pray that this message is blessing you right now. I love how Brother Bo unpacked that first story of Jesus silencing the storm. But hey, we're not done yet because we've got a second story, right? Second story is when Jesus destroys some demons. So anyway, turn to Matthew again, chapter 8, verse 28. And it says, When Jesus arrived on the other side of the lake in the region of the Gadarenes, two men who were possessed by demons met him. They came out of the tombs and were so violent that no one could go through that area. I want you to imagine the movie Train to Busan or Hashtag Alive in Netflix. People were running away from these two men like they were zombies. Because you know what? In many ways, this is what happens when people are ruled by evil or by selfishness, by greed, by lust, by pride. They become like zombies. You know, when you give in to evil, that's what happens. A part of you dies. Okay? Verse 29. They began screaming at him. Why are you interfering with us, son of God? Have you come here to torture us before God's appointed time? You know, this text is so ironic, the way Matthew positioned it. Because remember the first story? The disciples didn't know who Jesus was, but now the demons did. In the first uh, story, while in the storm, the disciples had to ask, Who is this man? But the demons, upon seeing Jesus, they declared, Son of God. You know, this goes to show that you can call yourself a disciple, but not really know who Jesus is. All right? And then verse 30, There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding in the distance. That's why from this text, you can actually derive from this, that this was Gentile ter territory. Why? Because the Jews, they didn't eat pork. Okay, so verse 31, so the demons begged, if you cast us out, send us into that herd of pigs. All right, go, Jesus commanded them. So the demons came out of the men and entered the pigs and the whole herd plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. Now we're going full circle with the story because we're seeing water again, just like in the first one, all right? And then verse 33, the herdsmen fled to the nearby town telling everyone what happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the entire town, this is how they, they, they responded, the entire town came out to meet Jesus, but they begged him to go away and leave them alone. All right? So the story goes is that Jesus encounters two demon-possessed men. They were coming from out of the tombs because the demons drove them to live there. Why? Because number one, you know, graveyards and the dead were terribly unclean and offensive to the Jewish people. They needed to go to a different place. Number two, because demons love death. And then, of course, number three, because evil likes to hide in dark places. You know, that's why if there is evil in your life, reveal it to the light. You know, confess it to God. Go to confession. Confess it to your confidence. You know, confess it to your account accountability partner. You can defeat evil by exposing it into the light. Okay? The demon-possessed men said to Jesus, why are you interfering with us, son of God? You know, they didn't want Jesus to interfere with their work. They said, mind your own business. Leave us alone. You see, evil doesn't want anything to do with God. But God has something to do with evil. That's good news for somebody. But one good thing to also point out that this entire time is that the disciples were actually with him. You know, they were witnessing firsthand the power of Jesus. You, they could see that Jesus had the power to heal and Jesus had the power to cast out demons. So you could say that they had many reasons to have faith, you know, even greater faith. But you see, in the first story, we see that instead of having faith, the disciples had fear. Remember the Roman centurion, the one that Jesus said had greater faith than the Israelites? They saw how faith had the power to heal. And yet afterwards, 
What happened? They still had fear while they were on the boat. Why is this? It's because they were just coming to know their faith. They were also getting to know Jesus. Remember that all of this was happening during the early years of Jesus' ministry. So they had only witnessed a few miracles. So in a way, they still did not know who Jesus was and who, what He could do. And you know what? In so many ways, when your faith is still new, what happens? You're still afraid. You're still doubtful of what God can do. But as you continue to go deeper in your faith journey, in your faith life, you become more and more aware of what God can actually do in your life, right? But anyway, think about this. If people needed Jesus back then to save them from a storm, to heal them from a sickness, to drive out demons, how much more now? How many of you need Jesus today? Come on, give me a virtual hands up. You need Jesus today? I say this because we live in, a, in an extraordinary, dangerous times. You know, da the danger today is not the same as the danger before because times have changed, okay? Evil comes in many different forms today. One could even say that evil is now more high-tech. If you, if you have the time, watch the documentary in Netflix called The Social Dilemma and you will see how evil can come packaged in smaller, more silent forms, okay? You see, that's what the devil does. He doesn't want to stand out. That's why he thrives in the dark. And that what he'll do is he will play a more, a more silent, a smaller game of mischief. He will feed you with fake news so that you will get confused. He will feed you with unbelief so that you won't believe in what God can do. But listen to me. The truth is not out there. It's not in social media. It's in here. It's in what God says, all right? It's in scripture. That's why you got to read the Bible more. You got to dig in the word, okay? The reason why I'm preaching this so passionately, it's because evil is real. It's all around us. It's in our families. It's in our communities. It's in our companies. You know, evil is what prompts a father to rape his eight-year-old daughter, for example. Evil is what drives a person to steal millions and billions from the public. So yes, there is evil in this world. And the sooner we open our eyes to this, the better for us, my dear friends. If the danger before was called persecution, you know, the danger today is called complacency. It's people thinking and behaving like, you know, everything is okay. But really, it's not. This is what Matthew is pointing us to. This is what he's teaching. He wants to open our eyes to the truth that we are all in a spiritual battle and the battle of good and evil is ongoing. So if evil is real, what should we do? I've got some bad news and some good news for you, all right? The bad news is that on our own, we cannot defeat evil. We cannot defeat the enemy. It's a lost cause. But here's the good news. Jesus has fought in our behalf. And through his life, his death and resurrection, Jesus has already won the war. Evil has been defeated. That's what our Catholic faith says. But some of you might be asking, well, if evil has been defeated, Brother Audie, why are we still swimming in a pool of poop. Okay, uh, there are other words to express that, but I'm using a more wholesome word, okay? The answer is found in what the demons told Jesus in verse 29. Have you come here to torture us before God's appointed time? You see, evil knows that its ultimate destiny is to be cast out. It's to be vanquished. It's to be destroyed. It's to be eliminated. Why? Because Jesus has already won the war. But while the battle is still ongoing, evil knows that its time is limited. So get this, evil will work twice as hard to inflict as much damage in your life as possible. But take heart, because if evil is working, God is working too. Can I get an amen? Anyway, let me put our two stories together, all right? I hope that you guys are still there. Brother Bo said that water is a symbol of chaos. That's why the image of a great storm, it frightens us, right? Because it's chaos all over. We don't understand it. it there's no control. And oftentimes, you will see that the storm is outside of the boat, right? It's, it's rocking your boat. It's shaking your life. It's shaking your peace because evil is out there. But in many occasions, you will also see that the storm can also be inside the boat, right? It's in your head, it's in your heart, it's in your life, because evil can also be found inside. So again, why was Jesus sleeping on the boat? 
Let me give you this truth, all right? This is a beautiful message that says there will come a time in your life when you will feel as though God might be sleeping and God is not working. In fact, some of you might be feeling like this right now as though God is not present and God is not there and God is not listening to you. But don't be afraid because it only means that it's not yet the time to vanquish evil. It's not yet the appointed time for God to show up. Get this. Evil is on a borrowed time. Sin is on borrowed time. And when the time is up, hallelujah, Jesus will wake up and vanquish and rebuke evil once and for all. That's where our faith is anchored to, that Jesus has already won. Let me end with this point, all right? We are slowly seeing how Jesus has absolute power, you know, not just with the outer world, not just with, with, the, not just with the power to calm the storm and the catastrophes that befall us, but He also has absolute power over the inner world. He is able to vanquish shame. He is able to vanquish evil. He is able to vanquish sin, right? But notice this pattern. All right? I don't know if you have been noticing this. We started with the leper a few chapters ago. People were afraid of the leper, so Jesus healed him. But instead, people became afraid of Jesus. The disciples were afraid of the storm, so Jesus calmed the storm. But instead, the disciples became afraid of Jesus. The town was afraid of the two demon-possessed men, so Jesus healed them. But instead, they became afraid of Jesus. It seems to me that every single time Jesus showed His power, people became afraid of Him. And you know, this shows, how, th this shows more about how fearful we are and not how faithful we are. This shows that we don't just lack faith, but we are also full of fear. You know, full of the fear of the unknown, full of superstition, full of doubt, full of unbelief. But the Bible says that fear does not come from God. So if fear does not come from God, where does it come from? It comes from the enemy. You see, the enemy uses fear to prevent us from seeing and knowing God. Isn't this true in your life? You know, whenever you ask the Lord to do something big in your life and He does it, you become more afraid of the outcome than you do of the actual blessing. You treat the blessing like it's a curse. You've been praying for a child and now that God has blessed you with a child, you're worried and you're scared about your capacity to raise that child. You have been praying for a business from God and God has blessed you with a business, but now you are scared about how to grow that business. You see, we focus on the fear and not on the fruit. So instead of becoming grateful, we become fearful. You see, this is the tactic of the enemy. If the devil can't make God stop from being good, he will find a way to stop you from being grateful. Because the devil knows that if he can get your focus off of gratitude, he wins. So maybe today is the day that you finally start fully trusting God and start declaring that He is your God. He's a good God. If He has brought you this far, it means that it's because He's capable of it. So let's trust Him, my dear friends. Let's trust the Lord. How do we trust the Lord? The best way to trust Him is to know Him. That's right. This is what unites these two stories. You see, both stories are all about Jesus revealing Himself to the world. He was telling people, this is who I am. I am capable, but I'm also compassionate. I am mighty, but I'm also merciful. So don't be afraid of me. I am in control of all things, whether seen or unseen, whether physical or spiritual. I can calm the biggest storms outside, but I can also cure the worst sicknesses inside. So follow me, learn from me, because there is still a lot you don't know about me. Hallelujah. We want to know you, oh Jesus. You know, since time immemorial, God has been revealing Himself to the world. He is constantly revealing Himself to you and me. That's why God says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if Jesus says, that He is all of these, guess what? He is Lord over all your problems. He is Lord over all your difficulties. He is Lord over cancer, over diabetes, over leprosy, over coronavirus, over death, over fear, over uncertainty. Can I get a capital amen from somebody? 
Hey man, you see, the devil is working, my dear friend. But guess what? So is the Lord. God is working nonstop to get your attention. So get your attention off of that hatred. Get it off that bitterness and put your focus on Jesus. Give Him your full attention, my dear friends. And although the storms might be raging outside of your boat and inside your boat, be still. Why? Because God is in your boat. And the Savior, once He is in your boat, everything goes calm. You have the peace of God. You have the calm of Jesus in, inside of you. Be still, because God is in your boat. I hope and pray that this message has blessed you today. Can we pray before we respond to God's goodness and God's love? Let's, let's just pray, everybody. Bow down your head. And let's just thank Jesus. Father, you are so good. Thank you so much for how loud and how clear you have spoken. We will begin to trust you today, Lord. And although there were many times in our life where we doubted your power and doubted your intentions for us, God, we see right now that maybe it's because it's not yet the appointed time of when you will vanquish the evil. But we wait, oh Lord, we wait in full trust and in full surrender. We will be still and know that you are our God and you are in charge. You are in control, oh God. We believe in your power. So reveal who you are to us in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button and tell people and all your friends and family about the inspiration they can receive here. And remember to subscribe and click the bell icon so that you get notified when we're going to upload the next inspiring video.